Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out to join us on a uh, more typical uh, snowy January evening here in Cleveland. Uh, my name is Brian Amkrat. I'm the executive director of the Laura and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, Case Western Reserve University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2016 Northeast Ohio Public Policy Series. Tonight's program is titled your money, your health care, accessing quality treatment at a time of rapid change. Before I introduce tonight's moderator, I want to recognize and thank a few organizations who are especially instrumental in making this year's public policy series possible. Our program partners are the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University, the League of Women Voters, Cleveland.com, the Cuyahoga County Public Library, and the Lakewood Public Library. We are also grateful to our corporate sponsor, First Interstate Properties, for supporting the series. Uh, I want to remind everyone about our upcoming public policy sessions. On February 9th at the Lakewood Library, Steve Litt will moderate a session titled Cuyahoga County Waterfronts and Neighborhood Development. And on March 1st at the Cuyahoga County Public Library Parma Snow Branch, Brent Larkin will moderate a session looking at Ohio's primaries. During the question and answer portion of this evening's program, please write out your questions and our staff will collect the cards and bring them up to the panel. So it is with great pleasure that we welcome Casey Ross, healthcare reporter for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, uh, to our stage this evening, and Casey will introduce our panelists. Casey is an award-winning reporter who covers the business of healthcare for the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Prior to joining the Plain Dealer in July, he spent six years as a business and investigative reporter at the Boston Globe. At the Globe, he covered everything from the Boston Marathon bombings to Bernie Madoff, and last year was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for a series on dangerous student housing conditions and exploitation of landlords. Before joining the Globe, Casey worked at the Patriot Ledger in Quincy, Massachusetts, and was the State House Bureau Chief for the Boston Herald. A native of Vermont, he now lives in Medina, Ohio, with his wife Rachel and son Archie. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Casey Ross. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks very much for coming out. Uh, can you all hear me? Um, I'm excited to be here tonight for what I hope will be a, a thoughtful discussion about healthcare and, and the dynamics of it and how it's changing and, and how uh, all of you can uh, access it in a, in a way that's uh, affordable to all of you. And um, I want to start by uh, just reading a brief introduction to sort of frame the discussion tonight and then um, I'll introduce the panelists. The business of American healthcare uh, is changing faster than it has at perhaps any period in our history facing runaway costs. The federal government, employers, and private insurers are changing the way, that, the way they pay for health care, and hospital systems and local doctors are consequently changing how they deliver care. And while more patients now have access to insurance, that doesn't necessarily mean they have better access to health care itself. In many circumstances, patients are being asked to pay more in the form of higher deductibles, coinsurance, and other forms of cost sharing. Whether that's a good or a bad thing depends on your perspective, and we may hear some different perspectives on that tonight. Uh, but the most important question is the one facing you and your loved ones on a daily basis. How do you not navigate this complex system of cost, risk, and rising medical need to get quality care that you can afford? To help us get at that question and discuss the broader dynamics at play in the healthcare market, we have an experienced panel of experts who have spent dozens of years working in this field. Uh, before I introduce them, just a quick note at the end of the discussion, uh, audience members will be invited to ask questions directly. Please keep in mind any questions. Uh, so please keep in mind any questions you have that we don't address during uh, the first part of the program. Uh, also remember that our panelists are not politicians. Uh, they don't want to be politicians. Uh, so they may be better at speaking to the impact of policies uh, instead of the debate uh, that surrounds them. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce to you all is Dr. Uh, Todd Zeiger. Dr. Zeiger is Vice President of University Hospital's Primary Care Institute and a practicing physician who provides family medical services at his office in Medina County. He also has more than a passing interest in sports medicine and is an associate medical team physician uh, for the Cleveland Browns. Maybe next season he can also help with a running game. <laughs> Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Zeiger is a Canton native and lives in Sharon Township with his wife Jill and three children. He will bring a great frontline perspective to our conversation and we're lucky to have him with us. 
Also joining us tonight is Heather Tilchin. Heather is a senior vice president with Medical Mutual in charge of strategy uh, and implementation of Medicare Advantage and Affordable Care Act products. She is responsible for a $600 million individual health insurance segment and plays a leading role in direct-to-consumer and brokered marketing strategy. She understands this business very well, and it's great to have her here. We're also very fortunate to have with us Sarah ha Hockenbrock. Uh, Sarah is the executive director of the Cuyahoga Health Access Partnership. The organization is a healthcare navigator that helps consumers enroll in Medicaid or find a plan available on the federal health insurance marketplace. She's on the ground floor of the effort to expand coverage to people who lack insurance. It is a challenging job that I'm sure will bring some important insights tonight. I'm going to start by asking each of the panelists individually a question, and then we're going to break into a more free-flowing discussion. Uh, don't worry, panelists, this will not be like the presidential primary debates where I start by asking you the most vicious question I can conceive of. <laughs> uh, Dr. Zeiger, I'm going to start with you. Uh, in your business, uh, there used to be a lot more independent physicians uh, who might have worked with local hospital systems but weren't necessarily employed by them. Uh, that is changing rapidly. With so many more physicians directly employed by health systems, how is that affecting consumers in terms of uh, the quality and cost of care? Uh, and I can speak personally that because uh, the first 12 years of my uh, practice of family medicine, which I don't know why we say practice because it, it connotates we never really get professional at or get it right. But in, in family practice, the first 12 years was independent, and then I joined University Hospitals eight years ago. So I've, I've experienced uh, uh, both sides. And um, it, was, it was with uh, a conscious decision that, that my group joined, um, and it was out of necessity with you know, rising costs with EMR and need to grow and bring on new partners and the barriers that, that are difficult with that. So it's, it's been a, a rewarding experience. And I think um, you know, from the patient perspective has, has been so too. It, you know, it, it aligns us with a, um, a health system that has a, a lot of um, specialty care uh, and care out in the community that, that uh, we can align with. And I think the benefit really from a, a patient perspective that uh, is great is that, that continuity of care uh, and information exchange where uh, I know uh, what, uh, uh, what has happened when they've been with the uh, uh, other providers uh, rather than when in the independent when they would go to multiple different systems because that wasn't necessarily aligned with anyone. Uh, some, the information sometimes was difficult to, uh, uh, to obtain uh, in an uh, efficient manner so that you could react to things that they had, had done. And uh, from a cost of care standpoint, what you would see often was duplicative tests where I had ordered something and referred them to a specialist and then they just repeated the same test even though we did our best to try to communicate what we had already done. So um, in the world now where we're, we're integrated and in the same health system, uh, I see that happen a lot less frequently because all of the providers uh, that I refer to have access to the same record and um, so we see, so I think that's one key point. Um, from a quality standpoint, I think the same thing, the, you know, the more uh, the more the, what the left arm and the right arm is doing, I think it uh, just helps with the patient from that quality perspective of, uh, of, the, of the care they're getting. So, And uh, Heather, there are, are quite a few insurers in Ohio offering uh, Affordable Care Act plans on healthcare.gov. What has Medical Mutual's approach to serving this market been? And, and please discuss the challenges in, in crafting a plan that's uh, both attractive to consumers and also augurs to the bottom line. It, it has been um, something that's very challenging. So going in from 2013 to 2014, rolling out our ACA plans, we knew which plans were very popular. But then with the law, there are essential health benefits. So for every single policy, regard is it not? Is this okay, guys? Can you hear me? Yeah. So for every single policy, we have to include 13 categories of essential health benefits, some of which are expensive, like maternity. And it doesn't matter if you're 65 years old and will never have a child. That has to be baked into your plan. Um, in addition, they have rules on the benefits, and, and, and they're fairly narrow in each 
metal tier plans, so there's platinum, gold, silver, that have to um, comply with those rules. And so that was a given. And we knew, and, and another thing was happening, right? We used to underwrite, and we used to be able to screen out people who didn't have insurance and, may, and had cancer already. Those rules changed. You can argue for the better or the worse, but one of the implications of that is that was really going to increase the cost of the plans. And I said, you know, it, it's now going from a car payment to a mortgage. So there were a couple other things we needed to decide because those things were given, was we are a health plan in Ohio. Were we going to continue to offer the broadest network in Ohio? We have made that decision, and we are still the third year into the Affordable Care Act, um, have that decision. Um, and then we also needed to decide where we're going to offer a full range of plans from catastrophic, which is really designed for those under 30 for big big things, um, to a platinum plan, which is pretty rich. And we decided to do, roll out with that full range. And we, we thought very strategically about what priorities were going to be in place. So the first thing we did was said, OK, we know these prices are going to go up, and they're going to go up significantly. So what decisions and what plan designs can we make that will help keep the price and the premium down for consumers? Then we also wanted to make sure that the plans, the features that were most popular in our pre-ACA plans, that we could carry them forward into the Affordable Care Act plans. And another thing we felt was really important was simplicity in design um, and in the portfolio. You saw some of our competitors get pretty convoluted, for example, with drug design and that type of thing. And we know these products are hard enough for consumers, so how can we make it as simple and transparent? But we also had to look at how could we help consumers save money and protect the bottom line by driving behavior um, that, was, that would save you money and save us money. And here is an example. So before the Affordable Care Act, we always had we covered non-emergency use of the emergency room. So I have a kid with a sinus infection on Sunday, go to the doctor, or go to the emergency room and get it covered. When you look at the cost of that, it costs about $386 on average for that visit. Where if you go see the doctor to my right, it's going to cost $78, and oh, by the way, probably going to get much better care and get in um, much more quickly and, and get what you need. And so we had to ask ourselves, are we going to continue to include non-emergency use of the emergency room, or are we going to restrict it to emergency room? And we decided to no longer do that. There's things we're, we're doing around drug the same way. Um, but as part of that, a, a big thing that we're doing uh, is trying to help consumers shop. I was talking to a member last week, and he had gone to his doctor, and he was um, you know, 50, and was getting his um, physical, and his doctor wanted an EKG. He said, you know, just, you're getting to the age, we just want this as a baseline. And so this member asked his physician, well, how much does that cost? And the physician said, I have no idea. And the patient had no idea. Well, can you imagine walking into Best Buy and having the guy go, hey, this is the TV I recommend. Well, how much does it cost? Right? And so we're, we're putting in tools to help people shop. And certainly, a lot of carriers are doing this as well. Um, you know, Here's just an example, an x-ray on your hand. I looked it up right before I came from my zip code right down the road. And depending on where you go, it would cost anywhere from $30 to $200. And so helping people become better shoppers and use their money more wisely, because an x-ray is an x-ray, um, are, are some of the things that we've, we've been balancing. And uh, Sarah, with this year's open enrollment season coming to a close, um, from your perspective, how does this open enrollment uh, compare with years past in terms of demand and the options that are available uh, on the marketplace for folks in Northeast Ohio? Sure. So. Beginning in 2013 is when we kicked off open enrollment here in Northeast Ohio. And at that point in time, this whole concept of enrolling by yourself 
online on a marketplace in which you could shop and compare plans was brand new for everyone. It was brand new for the feds rolling out healthcare, healthcare.gov. It was brand new for all of the assisters, whether they were um, federally funded navigators or local folks who signed up and did the training online. And we have found that in the past three years, our consumers in Northeast Ohio have gotten very savvy. They've gotten very smart. And that's because they're listening and they're paying attention and they're going out and doing a lot of research on their own. And what we have seen is an increase in the number of plans on the health insurance marketplace. Um, and with that comes a little bit more of a complicated process that we take consumers through because we view this very much as a personal interaction with each consumer that we help. Um, I've got three full-time and two part-time navigators who are stationed out in the field and cover Cuyahoga, Summit, and Lorain counties. And typically for a marketplace appointment, we'll do an initial screening over the phone so that we have an understanding of where the consumer is in terms of the income range. And then have them come in for a one-hour appointment in which we do the application. It's a very simple online application process that's gotten a lot faster because they've improved healthcare.gov but then we spend the bulk of our time with every consumer actually thinking about what are their health needs, how much health insurance do they actually need to purchase for their plan. What I might purchase for myself and my husband is very different than what my parents would need as they're just approaching that Medicare age. And so it's a very customized conversation to understand exactly how frequently somebody is using the healthcare system, whether or not they have some of those challenging pre-existing conditions that we need to account for, and if they're taking any cert certain types of medications that we need to look for on their prescription formulary, in addition to understanding where they want to go use that healthcare coverage, if their previous primary care doctor is already in a certain network, or if we need to make sure that they're looking for a particular hospital system. So there are a lot of those factors that we started out in 2013 with most of our consumers not prepared for that conversation at all. Whereas now many are coming in with an entire packet because they've done this a couple of years where they've tracked all of their expenses over the past couple of years. They know what they're paying and they know what they're looking for in their health insurance. Um, one of the other things that I think has been really interesting though is that as consumers have gotten more savvy and and are prepared for these conversations, it's a lot harder for us to get the word out to consumers. And so there isn't this large scale press in the media, whether it's local, state, or national, it's not as exciting of a news topic for folks anymore. It's something that we've already become accustomed to. And so it's rolled into that time frame right before Thanksgiving, over the December holidays and then into the first of the year. And that's a lot of noise for us to wade through to get to consumers and make sure that if they need to enroll for healthcare coverage between November 1 and January 31st, that they're getting that message and they don't end up waiting until you know, February 1st and realize they've missed the deadline and then they're gonna have to be worried about whether or not to pay a penalty. So it's been a, it's been a learning curve, but I think we are doing very well with it in Northeast Ohio. Um, and I'm actually, I would say, I'm proud to say, I think one of this region, both in Ohio in comparison to some national statistics, we're doing a very good job of getting to those consumers who need our in-person assistance, whether they're on the marketplace or if we need to help them sign up for Medicaid, which is the state and federal program that helps our low income adults under the age of 64. Yeah, it certainly is losing its luster a little bit as a, as a media uh, story. I know that uh, I was the only reporter who actually showed up for the open enrollment uh, kickoff press conference this year. So uh, yep. yeah, there were crickets there. Um, but um, I wanted to, to go into some group questions that hopefully you can all sort of uh, bat around and feel free to, to chime in on, on these. Um, as you like. Uh, the first thing I wanted to get into was, you know, a general trend that we've been seeing in, in um, a greater extent, that is a greater extent of cost sharing by consumers. Higher deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays. Uh, will the increase in patients sharing in direct health care costs achieve better health care or just bigger barriers to accessing it? Both. <laughs> So I, 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 think, uh, I think the answer is both. So the, that's the one concern that uh, I've had with the, uh, with the Affordable Care Act is their insurance may be affordable, but their health care isn't. 
um, and with these high deductible plans, and it's not just on, you know, with the Affordable Care Act, it was happening before that with the employer-sponsored plans that we were seeing significant rise in the, uh, in the high deductible plans where I think it's now over 50% uh, uh, of the uh, those that are offered that have high deductible plans being over a thousand dollar deductible a year, and so the concern then is um, though now they can afford their premiums, whether it's employer choice or whether it's on the uh, on the exchange, uh, that they pick the bronze plan because that's what they can afford. They, but they can't afford to access their health care because of out-of-pocket costs. Uh, so then it leads to decisions to not access care. Um, so that's, that's concerning. Um, but um, I think when the patient now consumer has um, has the the, uh, the need to, to uh, question, as Heather was talking about, the costs of things, uh, I think it helps lead to perhaps better care decisions. It was back before these high deductible plans when uh, first five years of practice uh, oftentimes it would be a condition that i would be seeing a patient for and um, they would say well can we just get an mri when it wasn't needed at the time and the part of the work up in the evaluation and when you try to talk to them about it wasn't needed it's like well my insurance covers it what's the big deal um, and not understanding that that is costing the healthcare industry, so, but to them it was, I pay my premium, it's covered, why can't I get it? Whereas now um, patients are asking uh, the right questions about why do I need to spend the money on this test, what is this going to do, and, and you know what decisions are you going to make different if you get this test? So I like the fact now that they're involved in, in that discussion about the value of the test we're going to do um, and, and the cost associated with that to make a, 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 an informed decision about that. So. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, so pre-ACA, our most popular plan, and Medical Mutual is the individual health insurer market share leader in Ohio, um, was an HSA-compatible 2,500 plan, which basically meant you can put money away in HSA, you would absorb about $2,500 of coverage, and then everything would kick in at about 100%. Now, by far, our most popular plan is our bronze, because of the affordability, 6000 so there is a lot more upfront costs that people are having to absorb. It is making them smarter shoppers and asking those questions. But one of the things we really worry about as a carrier, and, and we watch very closely with our disease management programs, so let's say we've had someone that's on insulin and they had to get this higher deductible plan and all of a sudden they're not using the insulin anymore, we reach out um, to make sure that there's this adherence to what the doctors are telling them because in the long run they're going to be healthier. So that's kind of added a cost to that side of the house which we think is very well worth spent. We also um, have designed plans where it's zero dollar for preventive care um, and in the Medicare market it's zero dollars to go see your primary care physician because we want them in there. We don't want that to be a barrier to getting the health care that they need, and so we're trying to balance it that way. And if I can chime in, one of the other components related to educating consumers is that if you're purchasing a, purchasing a plan on the marketplace, there are two built-in mechanisms for individuals that might help save on those initial costs. First of all, for your monthly premium, there is the advanced premium tax credit, which can be applied to the premium every single month to help bring down that cost. That's available to consumers who are between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level. But it is, it's meant to really help reduce that initial payment so that you keep your health insurance constant every month. And then the secondary component <laughs> is if you have applied for the silver plan, gotten that advanced premium tax credit, and then your income is actually below 250% of the federal poverty level, you would also then qualify for what's called the cost sharing reduction. And that can help some of those out of pocket costs for you when it goes to actually time to use your health insurance that you're trying to get in and get a doctor's appointment or they need to run some tests, then that cost sharing reduction can be applied to some of those out of pocket costs as well. Um, so as you're selecting a plan, it's important to walk through some of the different ways you might use your plan, especially if you are very frugal and cost conscious and want to try and plan out your health care expenditures, there are some things that we can try and do to map that out for consumers individually. 
And that's one of the things we've seen. Um, about two-thirds of our business is actually eligible for the APTC or what we call the subsidies, so paying for part of their premium. We have seen the individual market grow significantly in Ohio, um, and we have done a great job as a state of getting more people covered. But what we've learned is that the people that are most likely, especially for that cost-sharing component, to be eligible for it are the least likely to know it. And in about two-thirds of Ohio, are eligible for a subsidy. Um, and I think, you know, I do this party game, and I know no one will want to go to a party with me after I say this, of what percent of Ohioans do you think are eligible for this? And, and most people say 20, 15, and it really is about two-thirds. Um, and it can be significant to help pay the premium. And then for those in the lower income scale, like you talked about, um, it, can, it can get even more help. But we are, as a carrier, really trying to help get the word out, um, particularly and from a socioeconomic standpoint of, hey, you, you likely could be eligible for help. Let us, let us help you see if you can get help from the government to help defray some of these costs. So we're mm -hmm. trying to partner in, in that. I want to ask a little bit about um, sort of how the, the model of um, uh, health care delivery and paying for health care is changing. Um, so the question I, I guess I would pose was, you know, how does the desire by Medicare, whose actions are often replicated by uh, commercial insurers, to change reimbursement of providers to quality-based models instead of fee-for-service, how does that affect uh, the patient or the consumer? So we are, we are certainly, um, as we are going through and looking at the how we contract with providers, um, going to the more quality outcomes based model as opposed to the fee for service model is something that we and the industry are moving toward. And I think it really ties into what you're talking about, Dr. Sider, of, of how the how a lot of the physicians have come into the hospital systems where you get that more integrated care and hospitals are reimbursed by us more so by how well did the patient do, what is the readmission rate, have you brought that down, then okay, did I do this x-ray, did I do this test? And so I think it's driving for more responsible um, use of the resources as well as better outcomes is where we're working towards. I think one of the things that we are seeing is that it's not just about the actual quality of care. There are a number of issues that people that we're helping on a day-to-day -day basis encounter that don't relate to their actual health care at all. It's related to whether or not they have enough money every month to buy the right types of food to be healthy and follow their doctor's instructions if they're also taking medication for some type of cardiovascular issue or if they have high blood pressure. Do they have a safe neighborhood in which they can get out and exercise on a regular basis or do they feel trapped in their own homes when they go home at night? Um, there are a lot of those social issues that have oftentimes just as much of a significant impact on people's lives in our community. And I think that's one of the things that really for the healthcare industry, bringing payers, providers, physicians all together to work on some of those issues, that is where I'd like to see the next influx of decision makers and funding and, and advocacy come into play. Because we can do a lot of things around policy and make these shifts in the healthcare environment, but if we're not making it feasible for people to actually make some of those changes at home, then in some ways I do worry that we might be setting them up for failure and that you know we're striving for a quality initiative that really may not be feasible for your average day-to-day -day person to be a part of. And I, and I, when I uh, think of quality, I actually define it in, in two ways and put it in two buckets. You know, quality is the quality of the experience of your care, right, or the patient experience or the experience that you have with a uh, health care provider or the uh, uh, situation you're in. And then the other is the outcomes as to what Sarah was speaking to, the outcomes of your condition and what's the quality of care that was delivered to drive to the best outcome, whether it be a chronic condition or acute condition that, that you recover from. Um, as a primary care provider, this is something that I've actually asked for since I started practicing was um, instead of just being paid on how many patients I can see per day, how about if I take extra time and deliver a great experience and, and get good quality outcomes, why can't I be rewarded for that? And now that we're having that, I actually welcome it that it's finally here that we can, for, for those that uh, 
paid attention to that, you know, regardless of the previous system, and 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 made a conscious effort that it didn't matter. I had, you know, there was there was a, a sincerity of what you were doing. Now you can be uh, rewarded for that, and then partner with the patient for better outcomes, and look for, you know, whether things besides what. Um, what, what I uh, we, we talk about doing, you know, what are the barriers to you achieving that so we can engage. And that's where the system and, and being integrated with the system and, and not just being independent helps, where then the whole team is focused on the outcome. So the, the team of physicians, the team of healthcare workers, your therapists and whatnot are all striving for, for that outcome. So we're working together and, uh, and achieving that. So. I wanted to circle back, too, to ask a little bit more about sort of the impact of um, consolidation on uh, consumers and pricing. I mean, we all we all see this in our communities. We see uh, university hospitals and we see Cleveland Clinic and maybe to a lesser extent Metro Health expanding their access points and locations and acquiring more community hospitals. Uh, it's also happening on the insurer's side. We're seeing very large mega mergers of insurance companies. So I wanted to get the panelists to sort of weigh in on how this uh, consolidation that we're seeing very broadly, how is that gonna trickle down to consumers is it going to lead to higher costs or the things we have to worry about there? Um, so I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think higher costs. I think the one uh, benefit, um, you know, so in my organization, University Hospitals, where we now have uh, uh, 14 or 15 community hospitals and, and case medical center, um, what we uh, are trying to achieve with that is making sure that we can continue to uh, expand and deliver healthcare local to where people are. You know, the one in four hospitals now in the United States are uh, not able to make money and are in danger of going out of business. And we've seen it here locally where um, there's a uh, hospital, you know, Huron was closed and Lakewood is soon to be closed. And so there's there's issues with, with uh, independent hospitals being able to maintain um, uh, what they do. And so if it weren't uh, for the ability of, uh, of uh, a system like UH to come in and help, whether it be Parma, Elyria, uh, Robinson, you know, uh, Portage, uh, Samaritan, and National, those hospitals would have a difficult time staying open. Well, we can we can create uh, or maintain that, continue healthcare in that local community, bring services to those local communities that otherwise wouldn't have, and enhance the care there. Um, so, um, from a cost standpoint, I don't I don't see that it's uh, changing. I think it's continuing to provide care uh, in, the, in the neighborhood where it needs to be delivered with with high expertise. And I think on the payer side, um, it's too early to tell. The, the Affordable Care Act market is still very immature and we're figuring a lot of things out. You know, you have United Healthcare coming saying we might be out of exchanges altogether in 2017. You've got some major carriers in Ohio saying we're not going to pay brokers commissions anymore. Um, we are not making money on the Affordable Care Act plans, um, as are many of our um, um, fellow payers. And, and so I think there's two dynamics going on, the consolidation as well as the maturing of the market. And um, you know, we, we're very closely watching it, but I think it's too, we're too immature to really say what the impact of those things will be. And I think we're also seeing really kind of a refocus and a shift of how our healthcare providers are using the resources that they have. And if, if we're looking at a system in which maybe we had built up our community hospitals and every community had a small hospital and we're providing all of the same services but on very, very small scales, really there's, there's the macroizing of that. And so they're trying to shift those those services that are the most expensive and provide them in set locations, but then replace some of what might be lost with more consumer-focused programs and additional primary care and some of the more regular types of healthcare services that you would access on a more frequent basis. Um, you know, really primary care, dental, vision services, making sure some of those pieces are available in every community is important and it gives consumers some additional options then if there are additional selections, whether Metro, UH, or Cleveland Clinic are standing up those different sites in different communities, there's a little bit more choice on where you can start your healthcare journey versus starting that at the specialty care level. One of the things that um, you know we're seeing more of uh, under, and that's sort of incentivized under the Affordable Care Act, are so-called uh, narrow networks. 
these are insurance plans that restrict coverage to a small number of physicians in a given uh, geographic area. Uh, they come with lower premiums, um, but I wonder if the panelists can sort of weigh in if, uh, on whether you think that consumers understand sort of the trade-offs there and are you know, sort of have the information to adequately assess um, whether they're going to be able to get the services that they that they need for the price they're paying. I would venture to say that it's still very much the education process. I think just as much as our providers are learning and our insurers are learning, consumers are still learning about the very specific nature of plans where previously maybe they had an HR person and a broker, broker work out, this is the plan that's available to you. You either sign up or you don't. Now the consumer is actually wading through around 80 plans on the health insurance marketplace if they want to start from the biggest scope of searching possible. Um, um, so it, that's where I think really the education and a tailored conversation, sitting down with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, whether that's one of the plan providers, whether it's a broker, um, an agent, a certified application counselor, or an, a navigator, sitting down with somebody so that you don't feel that you have to go through that conversation all by yourself at least gets you to a little bit closer to a point where you are making a sound financial and health-related decision. Yeah, our research shows that and there's a wide, wide range of um, network options. So, for example, in the Cleveland metro area, you have a very inexpensive plan. It's HMO, and the only hospital system it contracts with is uh, metro. And then you've got Medical Mutual, which has the largest network of doctors and hospitals in the state of Ohio. Um, when... And, and we thought that's a real differentiator for us, and I think it can be and it is for people that understand, but the research we sh is showing that only about 50% of people look at network. And we do know that people are surprised because they call us and want to move, but because of the open enrollment periods, they need to wait. So I, I do think it's, it's very much people are learning and trying to understand those trade-offs between network and, mm -hmm. and price. I guess I would just just add that you know to, to be careful, right? If, I think the price is the first attractor, uh, and uh, and then the, if they don't look and see, okay, why is this less expensive? What are the aspects of this that, that may affect me? Uh, and I think it's surprised, as as Heather said, by uh, that their physician uh, that they just assumed would be in is not, and um, and now now are forced to change or a health system that they were used to be aligned with now they can't choose so. Um, and that's why the Sarahs in the world are there to help educate and, and guide to, to make sure they're making the right decisions that's for them. So, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, ask a little bit about uh, prescription drug prices. Um, in the past year, there's been an awful lot of news on this front. We've seen some pretty wild price spikes in all manner of different drugs, you know, for folks that need just ordinary care as well as uh, care for very serious life-threatening illnesses. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, short of all of us packing up and driving to Canada, you know, what can consumers, payers, and, and providers do to try to, you know, manage these costs and help people deal with these things? Right, and, and this is where I think consolidation is um, negatively affecting uh, healthcare with the pharmaceutical companies buying the generic companies and uh, and we've seen uh, just over the last year such a skyrocket both on the outpatient uh, with, with uh, patients in retail pharmacy and it's happening to hospital systems too in the inpatient pharmacy huge huge increases um, so the uh, um, you know the, the difficulty uh, Difficulty there is, you know, formulary plans, and again, you know, not being being surprised, you you know, you went on and changed your insurance, and now what was on formulary last year and the medicine you were used to always taking is no longer on formulary, and you show up at the pharmacy and and your copay is now seventy dollars instead of fifteen dollars, and it's the same medication. Does it make any sense, right, to the to the patient? Um, and so, um, being mindful of that, what what can we do as as a team with you know, physician and patient is, you know, look at uh, formulary and make alternative choices. A lot of time there are alternative choices, but, um, and it used to be the generics were always, you know, there are lots of times the generics are just as effective, um, and, and there was wide choices, but now that's what's starting to uh, erode is the uh, generic manufacturers are being um, bought up and there's less in number and it's, you know, the supply demand issue and then the, the costs go up because they control, so it's difficult. 
at the consumer level, um, here in this community, we actually have a couple of fantastic resources that when we encounter consumers that are having a hard time with their prescription health care coverage, one of the very first things we do is we connect them with United Way 211 and their Med Refer RX program, which actually is a wonderful young woman named Adrian who sits with every single consumer that contacts them to try and process a payment assistance program for the specific type of medication that they're on. And if she finds that they're on a on a medication that there might be other low cost options. She also educates them and arms them with that information so they can take that information back to talk to their doctor about some other things that could be considered because what they, the doctor has given them initially may just not be feasible based on cost. Um, and then a secondary resource that I think our staff really take advantage of and try and refer to are getting people connected to Project Hope to really help them with some of the initial prescription cost outlays while they're waiting on those types of um, prescription assistance programs to come through and go through the sign off and approval process. Um, so those are two of the ways that we're working with consumers, but really it is about monitoring annually to see what's changing on these plans to try and figure out what does a consumer need to be aware of year after year. And that's, again, well, I'll, my, my talking point for the evening is really making sure that you're having a conversation with somebody who's knowledgeable and educated and who's going to really be prompted to ask you that question when it gets time to make a choice about your health plans. And um, from a payer perspective, I mean, the reality of it, for many of the reasons Dr. Sider talked about, our specialty drug costs in the last two years have gone up 300%. And so there's things that we've had to do to help drive people to make different choices to save themselves money, but then also for us to be able to keep, keep premiums as low as possible for everybody on the plan. And so where consumers have a choice, we've implemented some things. So for example, it's twice as expensive if you have to go to CVS or Walgreens because you just want to visit that pharmacist and pick it up versus mail order. So we've implemented something, and I'm not saying this is necessarily popular, but I think it's necessary to help continue to keep costs down. Uh, you can go to the retail three times, and oh, by the way, you can continue to go to the retail after that, but we'll charge you $50 for a brand name drug um, at mail order and 100 uh, if you continue to go to the retail. Another big place is where you choose to get specialty drugs, and oh, by the way, I am a specialty drug user. Uh, if you go to outpatient um, infusion, it costs 10 times as much if you go to your doctor's office and get it administered. And so we're trying to help people manage through these skyrocketing um, drug costs by helping guide them as far as the best places to buy and, and receive their medicine. And we want them to receive their medicine, as I talked about, because they stay healthier longer term. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask about that I think we've sort of touched on a little bit, you know, a question I get a lot or a complaint I guess I get a lot from uh, consumers is the difficulty of sort of understanding, you know, medical bills, what they get charged. Um, you know, you get the bill in the mail and it, sometimes it's hard to make heads or tails of it uh, for people. So I wondered if the panelists can discuss sort of the efforts to try to make, to, to introduce a little bit maybe more transparency uh, in the billing. Um, and uh, the efforts to provide sort of cost certainty up front for people, uh, introducing ways to let people know exactly what they're going to owe when the process is over. Yes, yeah, so, um, so a two-part answer to that, because I kind of heard a, a two-part question. One was um, tri price, price transparency. I think the, the latter part of your question was, you know, um, uh, going into uh, a healthcare decision, uh, whether it be a, a diagnostic test or a procedure, whatever, is what is my out of pocket cost going to be with this, especially when there's high deductible uh, associated with it and there may be a significant amount. So um, I think the uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, providers and uh, systems are starting to respond to that. Uh, UH has a product called ClearQuote that's available when you call and schedule an appointment. We can provide for you um, what we think with high accuracy what your out-of-pocket expense is going to be for that procedure. So responding to that need I think is important and, and we're providing that. Um, on the other side, the first part of your question, say again Casey because I'm 
uh, the transparency. The, the bill, yeah. right. So, the bill itself. So just yeah. like we're not politicians, I'm not a biller either, so I <laughs> know. Um, but no, that that is, I mean, that's, you know, I, I'm, I, I've been a patient and with, you know, with family and, and in, and, and that is probably one of the biggest pain points um, uh, in the healthcare world is the multiple bills you get and they come in piecemeal and one from a physician, then one from the radiologist and then from the lab and then from the pathologist, you know, and it's just so hard to make heads or tails of that. And so I think another priority is to get to that one bill um, and again, the, uh, I guess it brings up the other advantage I see of when you're in a health system where everybody is in the same system that you can create that one bill. So uh, when you're uh, along the line of services, it helps simplify that. Are we there yet? No, but we're heading there and, and want to be there because we recognize that's important. <laughs> One of the other ways that our staff actually help consumers is the nine months outside of open enrollment when they're working with consumers, a lot of times we are working with folks in a post-enrollment environment. So these are people who have already signed up, but they, are get no they get notices in the mail and they're not sure what everything is for, especially if this is somebody's first time actually being on private health insurance. They're not accustomed to the three different mailings that you might get in regards to the one procedure or doctor's office visit. And so we actually encourage folks Folks to call their navigator back who helped them sign up for, uh, for health care coverage, when they start receiving bills and information they don't understand, that's actually a way that we can still help educate consumers outside of the open enrollment environment, is to sit down and walk through what are each of the bills and the documentation and the explanation of benefits and all of those things that a lot of consumers receive in the mail and open and then they stack them somewhere and say, I'm going to deal with that later. Instead of waiting to deal with it later, we encourage them to bring all that stuff with them and we can help sort, that, sort it through so they understand what each document means that they're looking at. And, and we're trying to um, kind of take a three-pronged approach, one in the shopping process, when when people are going to use care, and the other when the, when the bills come out. So from a plan shopping standpoint, we have built functionality online, which our brokers and agents um, can use, that helps someone understand if I buy this bronze 6,000 versus this silver 3,000 plan, what can I expect if I go to the emergency room? What are my ac maximum out of pocket costs so they can look and say, okay, would I rather have more certain costs month to month or would I rather have lower cost over owning the plan? Then as I talked about, when people are going to use services, okay, I need to get an x-ray in my hand, um, where, where can I go and, and what is the cost and getting much more transparent with that. And then finally, and this touches both on what Sarah and Dr. Sider said, was um, when the bill comes, we used to just list out, we, we call our explanation of benefits. Okay, this happened, you, you know, you got a knee replacement, but the anesthesiologist did this, you got this bandage, or you know, you, you know all the stuff much better than me. But we used to lay it out, and now what we're doing is a term of bundled care. And so, for example, last April, I had an emergency appendectomy with complications, and the bill came where I could see everything in the total cost of my appendectomy. And then we're also breaking it out of what did the what did we pay versus your responsibility. So my insurance company happened to pay, which is Medical Mutual where I work, um, sixty thousand dollars in total for that, and I paid thirty five hundred. But you know, I, I think we're trying. I think as an industry, we've done a disservice in in not showing the the true cost of of the total um, treatment. And so we're trying to help people understand the value they're getting for their rising dollars as well. Well, I want to move on to some of the audience questions and a, a lot of really good questions here. I apologize in advance if I'm not able to, to get to all of them. Um, I think this first one is really more squarely in Dr. Zeiger's realm, um, and it's something I think you touched on earlier, but um, a, a different maybe aspect of it is sort of how the new push on uh, you know efficiencies uh, for healthcare providers, um, the need to be more efficient is impacting how physicians are able to you know deliver uh, services. Um, so the, uh, the, the answer to that I, ha I would say is that it's um, it's changing from j not just the physician who's um, your care provider, right? Now it we, we it needs to be a team, um, and because you're right, the, there's 
so much to handle uh, at any one visit. A lot of information with preventive visits uh, and personalizing your care for the things that you need. It really takes a care team to deliver that in an efficient manner. Um, so um, whether that be you know, LPN, medical assistant, RN, um, social worker, uh, things like that. And it may not be in the office, but outside where you're calling on services. But within the office, I think the care team is what we're trying to respond to so to help deliver that efficiency so that the time that's that the provider is with you, physician, LIP, or physician assistant, uh, is, is valuable time, but then you also have a care team around them that's helping with um, your educational needs and, and medication issues and things like that. So. Um, and, and this one perhaps more for, for Heather and Sarah, a, a fairly direct question. Uh, is the individual policy market broken? I'll take that first, Sarah. Um, <laughs> goodness, you know, I no, I would, I would argue no. I think we are moving into a very different world with individual policies, in which people actually have different options to shop for the first time. Um, there is still a whole separate private marketplace outside of the health insurance marketplace where you can still go purchase a plan. But if you want to try and take advantage of the advanced premium tax credit and the cost sharing reduction, and you want to shop in a web portal that allows you to do a little bit of online comparison, then I would argue that that gives you a whole new avenue to do that type of shopping that wasn't available three years ago. Um, we're actually a very small private nonprofit, and so we're now having some of those conversations of previously trying to provide health insurance through the more traditional route of working with a broker and having a plan that everybody could select from do we actually go the route of letting our employees choose health insurance on the health insurance marketplace and give them that stipend directly to make that choice so they get to make their own choices about what's important to them for their health insurance versus what we're selecting as an administration and a board. Um, so I, I, I'm seeing an era that has more choice, but I do understand that for some consumers that's um, very daunting it's overwhelming and it takes a lot of time and energy to wade through if you want to do it all by yourself. And, and, and keep in mind, so Sarah talked about the products that are available outside of the healthcare marketplace, those products that we're selling are still have to comply with healthcare.gov. There have been places, aggregators like eHealth, that type of thing to do more of the shopping that she's talking about. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I think this law will continue to evolve. I will say that there are winners in the law and there are losers in the law. There are unintended consequences of the law. Um, and But overall, when you look at it, there are more people insured in Ohio um, than there were before the um, changes were made a couple years ago in the individual marketplace. Another question from the audience, um, you know, will high deductibles cause people to forego preventive uh, care? And can you talk a little bit about how preventive care you know, might be defined? So preventive care, we have a wide range of things from um, you know, your mammograms um, to, to different screenings, colonoscopies, that type of thing. We have a, we have a broad definition. And we don't charge a premium at all. It doesn't it doesn't go to their deductible. Um, those things are covered free of charge under our plan. So the preventive care um, is something that it, it, it has been a real benefit. And actually before the Affordable Care Act, we also provided preventive care for, for free as well because we want people to be doing those screenings. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we see then is once people access that preventive care and maybe they haven't been using the healthcare system for a period of time, then we find that something is discovered. They've left something that's gone untreated for five, six, yeah. seven, ten years. And then it is a point where consumers then do need to take action and use their health plan. And the higher deductible plans are the ones that are causing people a lot of personal concern and angst. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we're seeing now is different communities are actually trying to rally around 
the fact that we know that our deductibles are a little too high with the health insurance marketplace and the plans that have been built there. So instead of trying to help people necessarily with the out of cost or out of pocket premium costs that they have to pay every month, there is a community out in Wisconsin. Um, the county name escapes me at the moment, but they've actually worked with a third party administrator, foundations, insurers, and healthcare providers to put together an assistance program to try and alleviate some of that out-of-pocket deductible costs so that when people in their county in Wisconsin need to use their health insurance, there is a local organization that has banded together and brought those providers together to put a pot of money together and that is where they can get some relief from that deductible cost. Um, so I think those are some of the types of things that you're going to start seeing communities try and figure out on their own. I think that the, the two things I see that, uh, that can create some, some concern is um, is when they come for a preventive visit, you know, they say, well, my, you know, my visit with you, the primary care is free, so that's why I'm here, but um, then you discover based on you know, personal history, family history, social history, whatnot, or in the, during the course of the exam that um, non-preventative or diagnostic uh, assessment is needed, and now uh, unexpected costs uh, are, are kicked in, and then that's where there's, there's sometimes difficulty in um, following through with that decision because the mindset and psyche coming in was, get my preventative free exam, and uh, then I'm good for the year, and, and uh, we uncover things that, that need it, and then that high deductible issue comes into play, and, and that's that's difficult. The other is then just a, the variability of what is covered in preventive screening, whether it's just the PCP visit or is it the screening tests, and when does the deductible apply, and that can be difficult to navigate. So. What can the uh, state of Ohio do to improve uh, health care in Northeast Ohio? Are there any you know, pending policy considerations up in the air right now that you're paying particular attention to that you think might um, you know, improve care here? The continued expansion of Medicaid, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's where it's not permanent yet, right? So, Med Medicaid expansion has been one of the pieces of the Affordable Care Act that we wouldn't have been able to get to without the passage of the Affordable Care Act. So that's one of the things that I think really is sometimes lost in the political conversations is that in Cuyahoga County and Northeast Ohio, we've helped over 286,000 people get signed up on the expansion of Medicaid, which previously really wasn't available for low-income adults that weren't, that weren't uh, the the paternal parent and had the dependent connected to them. And so that has been one of the components that we have really championed and we've continued to fight for, um, along with a very broad consortium of people in Northeast Ohio. I think there are, um, going back to the social, the social determinants of health, I think that's really going to be one of the next statements that the Ohio Department of Health, Ohio Medicaid, and Ohio Job and Family Services are going to have to start leading the banner of, of promoting those conversations in communities to say how do we actually tie people's health care, their ability to get good paying jobs, and their ability to manage and understand their health together so that we can address these social determinants of health, whether it's housing, um, food assistance, employment that is actually paying them a livable wage here in Northeast Ohio, some of those social issues. Given the presence of uh, such great healthcare institutions in Northeast Ohio, uh, why do we rate so low in general health of the local population? That's a tough one. Um, I'll, I, again, I will jump right in and say, you know, we have in Northeast Ohio an urban population that is actually living at or below the poverty line, and with that, they're not living in safe neighborhoods where they feel that they can get out and take advantage of the wonderful, bright, sunny days that we do get in maybe six months out of the year up here. Um, there, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> after, we, after we've all shoveled out our, our <laughs> cars and our driveways, a little sunshine will be welcome when it gets here. Um, those social issues are a lot of times the things that prevent people from even thinking about their health care first because they need to make sure that their kids are getting to school. They need to make sure that they have either bus fare or a car that runs and can get themselves to work. And they need to make sure that all of these other things come first before they address their own health care needs. And that's, that's a significant challenge with the population that we're working with. 
And as carriers, to really tie into what Sarah's saying, we see um, across a socioeconomic perspective, um, when you look at these preventive services, um, there are the group of people that tend to be on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale are not seeking out and getting the preventive care as early as they could or should. And then, like Dr. Ziegler said, all of a sudden, right, it's five years down the, they've been having this problem and something that you could have controlled much earlier all of a sudden becomes much harder to get under control because it's progressed. And so we are really making a lot of efforts to try to help educate uh, on the, the benefits of those types of things and to, to help improve the health by getting in front of it. And we sure do, don't we? The first part of that question was, you know, given where we live, I mean, we are so lucky in Northeast Ohio um, with, you know, with the major health systems we have here. I'd uh, be hard to rival other, uh, any other place in the country that has the, the, the quality of care we do with the major systems here. But you have to be able, to, you have to want to access it and be able to access it. And that's what the points that were made is um, they can be there, the physicians and the systems and smartest people in the world, but if the patients can't get there or don't know how to get there or the importance of getting there uh, because of the, all the different barriers that, that could be. Um, with the Medicaid expansion, now we're seeing a, you know, a, a lot of patients now come and still utilize the emergency department uh, for their preventive or primary care, and, and they don't have primary care physicians. We're doing a lot of efforts to try to educate them the benefits of, of selecting a primary care physician and helping them actually make that appointment before they even leave the emergency room. Uh, we can do that through an online service where you know, we make the appointment for them, so they leave with an appointment with a primary care physician, but um, there still is even high no-show rates with that because it's a lot of is the not just the uh, accessibility, but the uh, education, the importance of um, uh, to, to follow through with that, so. To add on to that, actually, even outside of our big playing hospital partners that are up here in Northeast Ohio, we have a very rich and robust federally qualified health center network that is a perfect location for a lot of our low income consumers to access primary care for the very first time because their federal funding was tied for them being located directly in those communities that need the most assistance. Um, so those are the organizations like Care Alliance, Neighborhood Family Practice, the Free Clinic of Greater Cleveland has now transitioned to a federally, a federally qualified health center. Um, NEON, Northeast Ohio Neighborhood Health Services, Asian Services in Action, all of these organizations are really there to serve some of the lower income populations of Northeast Ohio. And there are more than 22, 23 sites just here in Cuyahoga County alone for, from those federally qualified health centers. That is extremely rich in comparison to coming from the Dayton, Cincinnati area. When I left there, we were just getting the first lookalike clinic stood up back in, I think, 2008. So this community not only has those resources in place, those have been there for years and are deeply entrenched and established in some communities. So that's getting that knowledge out and getting that information out about some of the other health care providers that maybe people don't think of or haven't heard of yet is just as important as getting them connected to the hospital partners where they can get the best quality specialty care anywhere in the country. We actually, at UH, we see that as, you know, we, we were born from the community, right? The community created us. And so, you know, we owe the community to, to give back. And so um, part of that is, you know, health, health and wealth go together, right? And so if we can create local wealth through job creation um, and, and uh, helping those that uh, would otherwise be uh, difficult to, to achieve employment, you know, there's... Um, we're involved with an organization called Evergreen uh, that helps people um, get employment that would otherwise have difficulty doing so. And it's a they have equity in the company. And um, the Evergreen does, uh, they, they grow uh, uh, herbs and um, vegetables that we actually purchase for use in our hospitals. Uh, they have a solar um, consulting firm that they use solar energy. And they also have a laundry facility. And we use that. So anytime we can do local and support local um, uh, places like that, or even just you know local uh, employers to grow, that's that's important because if you can grow the wealth of your community, then you grow the health of your community. So, well, One question I kind of wanted to interject in this too is, you know, I wondered under population health and the preventive care model, I wonder if the, the role of the patient, uh, you know, themselves is sort of changing a bit in, in how they sort of are responsible and the responsibilities that they carry sort of under this system. 
Yeah, the change is increased, right? There's increased responsibility uh, to, to the patient. Um, it's not just in the, in the financial aspect that we've already talked about, but in, in the uh, uh, ownership of and, and following through and, um, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with the right engagement and making sure that, you know, our role is to make sure that you're making a well-informed decision, that you understand um, uh, what we've talked about, and, and if, if we do the right engagement, then um, uh, the hope is that, that the uh, patient then does need to follow through with you know, what we've discussed and talked about. And, and um, part of our role, too, is recognize when there's barriers, but I can only help uh, with barriers if I know about those barriers. So uh, we talked earlier about medication. You know, if I, um, if we decide together that uh, taking a certain medication is the right thing to do and you go to the pharmacy and you can't afford it uh, and then walk out of there and never fill it, uh, but don't tell anyone or don't call or and say, hey, doc, I, I can't afford that. Can we do something else? Then we can make a change, but I don't know about it. And the next time I see you, I ask, how are you doing on that medication? I never filled it because I couldn't afford it. And it's three months later. So I think there's, you know, uh, they need to be engaged and responsible for making sure that uh, you know, we, we can only help what we know, right? So uh, keep us informed. A lot of the initiatives related to the Affordable Care Act as it relates to the consumer education piece is also educating people that they're, they're empowered to start asking some of those more detailed questions of their provider and helping consumers understand that we can start shifting that power dynamic a little bit. It's not just that you have to go into your doctor's office and they're going to give you a laundry list of all the things that you need to do in order to make your life better and to be healthier. You get to actually ask them a lot more direct questions based on some of the research you've been able to do on your own and hopefully start changing some of the relationships so that it becomes a partnership in health, not just the prescriptive form of medicine that we've really been accustomed to. And that is a big shift for, um, particularly I think here in Northeast Ohio, for low income populations and then minority populations that have also traditionally had some trust barriers with the, with the healthcare community and the medical community historically. So there are a lot of those things that we are working with multiple generations to try and help overcome. This next question is sort of a, a bit of a case study, kind of a scenario for you all to sort of help out with a little bit. Um, I'm employed, and I have a health in, and I have health insurance through my employer. I have a wife and a dependent child. My wife and I would be eligible for Medicare. How would I go about evaluating my options for health care for me and my family? Well, I, yeah, there's certainly many channels to reach out. There's Brokers that can help navigate there are the health insurance carriers can help walk through from a needs based perspective what is the best for you. There's certainly the navigators, healthcare.gov, um, to help you really think through these are your needs, these are these are how you use healthcare and the healthcare things that you need in terms of prescriptions, and then what is the most affordable option. Um, for you, if you want to. Especially for the Medicare piece, a lot of it is about the timing. So this is, it's hard to do it as a case study, but for Medicare in particular, you have the three months before your 64th birthday and the three months after to get signed up on- 65th. 65th, thank you, sorry. <laughs> I live in the world of 64 and under, I apologize. Um, so, and since we don't do Medicare enrollments, we connect those consumers to the Ohio Senior Health Insurance Information Program, and they actually have a very similar volunteer-based model of seniors who can come out and sit and ask a lot of those very detailed questions versus you having to do it all over the phone or do the research by yourself on the internet. And that would probably address some of the issues with the two adults who would be Medicare eligible. And then I think there was a dependent child or a under 18, over yeah, 18, or? There, yes, there is a, it's a dependent child, yeah. And and so that would be, you know, where the child wouldn't fall under the Medicaid, co or the Medicare coverage, but there are other options for children, especially if your family is anything a little bit like ours, that one of my parents is going to be able to sign up for Medicare a little bit before the other, so my mom's gonna still be on a private insurance plan at some point, and my dad's already gonna be on Medicare doing his own thing. So if if it were my family, then you'd stagger it a little bit that dad could go on Medicare as soon as he was able. Mom would eventually trans transfer over, and then hopefully the child would age up to where they're either 
able to be on a plan on their own. They might qualify if there's no income. They might qualify for Medicaid in the state of Ohio. Um, there are a lot of options. You'd have to really sit down and piece out what the whole family scenario was. This one is actually a, a, a question directly for Sarah. Um, what is the demographic of your clientele? Uh, do you feel that the ACA is reaching people that are underserved uh, and those who might have lower health literacy and, and might have a, a difficult time uh, accessing the system? So CHAP actually was founded in 2008 with the creation of a local health access program before Medicaid was expanded. And at that time, we were helping consumers get signed up, or actually sign up on our access plan, which would let them get access to specialty care services. Those consumers were all at 200% of the federal poverty level or below. So they were some of our most vulnerable community members. And that has been a lot of the demographic and population that we have strived to continue to work with, even as we've made the transition to a navigator entity. Um, our Medicaid numbers are much, much higher than the actual number of consumers that we enroll in a qualified health plan on the marketplace. Uh, but that is really by design for us as an organization because that was the type of population that we were formed to serve. And I would say at this point, we're still continuing to work with that, with that demographic. Um, as a community, especially with the expansion of Medicaid, there were a number of organizations that rallied together around the same time to say, with a concerted effort, not only is this good policy and not, not only does it bring significant financial wins into our community, it's the right thing for us to do to make sure that we give this tool to access to these consumers. There is still a lot of work that we had ahead of us, though, because really all we've been able to do thus far is get a lot more people covered. We haven't solved all of those barriers that are preventing people from actually using that health care coverage to get into the health care system and be a part of that on a day-to-day -day basis, probably the way many of us are, and that we know how to use the health care system. Um, we make our, our primary care doctor's appointments every year. We know it's really important to get your dental screening and checkup and cleaning every six months. Some of those things are ingrained in you if you've grown up with health care coverage versus an individual who hasn't had that and has only been using an emergency department for episodic care. Um, so we have a lot of work to do still ahead of us in this community. And this is an issue that, um, that has been in the news a lot lately that my colleague Bree Zeltner has done a, a lot of good work on. Um, the question is, how can we improve um, infant mortality levels in uh, Northeast Ohio? That is, um, I will say that is a particularly puzzling problem for the state of Ohio and Northeast Ohio and Cuyahoga County in particular. Um, Cuyahoga County, I think, because Bree has done some of those, some of that research, I think Cuyahoga County is actually the last county in all 88 counties in terms of our infant mortality, which is a terrible place to be. Um, there are some very new and, and innovative programs that are coming out of different parts of Ohio. One of them is called the Pathways Community Hubs Model, and that was pioneered by doctors Mark and Sarah Redding in Mansfield, particularly to address this issue of infant mortality. And what they created was a very, very specific pathway for a mother to, when she finds out that she's pregnant, to begin her, her prenatal care, go all the way through that prenatal care and make sure that with the help of a community health worker, hit some of those very specific benchmarks that you're supposed to hit when you're pregnant in order to deliver a healthy baby and then continue working with that community health worker over the first year of that baby's life to get them to that first birthday. Um, so I think those are some of the programs that you're going to start hearing a little bit more about from the state of Ohio and from other organizations around the state. Um, I think the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, and some of our hospital partners have really started those conversations now. And I, it's about time. I think now is the time to really wrestle and grapple with that issue so that we can put the plan in place here. This is a question that uh, we touched on a little bit before, but it, I think it does bear uh, circling back to a bit. Uh, you know, how are the in insurance company drug formula formularies, you know, and the changes that are happening there uh, impacting patient care, uh, you know, accessibility to medications that people feel they need for their uh, optimal care? So, you know, from an insurance carrier standpoint, we have doctors on our staff 
we have uh, pharmacists on our staff. And it is very important to us to make sure that people get the drugs that are clinically necessary to take care of their conditions. Now, as I talked about as well, there are things we need to do to control costs. So that might include step therapy, um, which I've just gone through as well, um, where could you try a less expensive lower class drug that should do the same thing clinically from a doctor's perspective um, and then work your way up to the higher cost things. Um, accessibility, you know, is it is it more narrow accessibility of you can't go to, or it costs you more if you go to Walgreens and if you buy mail order, yes, but the drug is still available. Um, and so really what we're doing is trying to help people save by making the most clinically appropriate, and we work with major health systems with this as well, um, care and getting it at the right place, but we are not cutting off drugs um, for people who need them, certainly not. No, I think that, you know, uh, so the insurance companies cover the medications, the, the issue is when you change, right? That's the probably the biggest hassle factor. You change an insurance company, then they have a different formulary. So I would encourage if you've you've gone through open enrollment and you've changed your plan, or even pay attention if your plans change, bring your formulary book with you to the first appointment of the year uh, if things have changed so we can make sure that what we're ready to refill is actually on formulary and make the change at that time. A um, lot easier to kind of make that decision then when we're together face to face and can have discussion about it than you get to the pharmacy and get surprised and um, and then we got to start, you know, making other decisions, so. I'm going to uh, cave and ask a slightly political question. <laughs> Uh, uh, As opposed to some that haven't been remotely political. No, already. not at all. So I'm going to broaden a little bit. So the question is, what aspects of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act would you change? I want to broaden that a little bit to sort of ask also, is there, in your experience, is there an unintended consequence of it that you've noticed, um, you know, that you might comment on a little bit? So I think f flexibility, and Heather kind of mentioned it actually in her first comments, I think the flexibility to choose a plan uh, that um, the mandated coverages doesn't apply to you so that you can help reduce costs potentially that way. So that if you don't need child care to 26 or you don't need um, birth control, that if you can choose a plan that you can carve out preventive stuff that um, doesn't negate what you know anyone would would need prevention, but you know is unique to whether it be a, a demographic, an age, or a gender uh, that you can choose. I think that would be the one thing I would see to change that could help reduce maybe the cost for the, the for that particular individual. So a little more individualized choice on the coverage options. I think as the ACA was built, this is I, my my former boss would always refer to this as legislation that was made like sausage. And it was a very messy process. It had people and industries from all across the healthcare spectrum involved trying to get something out of it that benefited their institution versus harming them. And as a result, we do have some challenges with the ACA, but there are a lot of other wins that as a, as a result of that, we don't necessarily see on a, on a regular basis. It's much easier to talk about all of the stuff that irritates us or drives up cost. And I think one of the areas that I would love to focus on from a policy standpoint is this affordability and deductible component because I think that is one of the components that um, the insurance industry has a very strong lobby in Washington and that they have a very, very healthy voice. But there are other factors and considerations that need to be taken into account when you're also trying to report to your shareholders that you're turning a profit. Is that a profit that is what, what I would argue built on the backs of the people that you're saying that you're taking care of? And are there so many people outside of that system that wouldn't have access to care? Um, it's, it's a really challenging environment, I think, for me because of the low income population we work with there are folks who would never succeed in a private industry or private marketplace, a private health insurance plan. Um, we have a very long way to go. And so that stratification between our most low income consumers 
and everything that specialized industry is getting out of it, there's a lot to bridge between those two areas of the community that I see. And, um, you know, certainly a big benefit to this is more people are covered, both in Medicare, Medicaid and the individual market. And people that couldn't get insurance and needed it are getting covered. Um, but consequently, the cost has gone up significantly, particularly for people who were in the individual market pre-ACA. We, like many other carriers, when the president had his speech and said, yeah, uh, you can keep your plan if the state will allow it, which um, the Ohio Department of Insurance did, and your carriers will allow it. Um, about 90% of those people, if they were to move into Affordable Care Act plan, their rates would go up significantly. And it gets to part of what Dr. Ziegler was saying around that flexibility um, around the plan design, I think is something that um, this has been some of the unintended consequences for people who are already in the market, even though we are helping many more people. And when you look at the deductibles that Sarah talked about, um, that's really been a reaction to the insurance industry. Two things, of one, just trying to keep the prices down a, as much as possible. Um, and oh, by the way, we're a non-for-profit uh, mutual company who is losing money <laughs> on our Affordable Care Act plans, um, but then, also, there's a need to have people be smarter shoppers. And if you're not on the hook for a deductible, are you gonna spend more time shopping for peanut butter than where to get my EKG? And so there's, there's trade-offs there as well. And I understand what you're saying and that it's, it can be, those dollars get big and can get big. I mean, for a maximum amount of pocket for a family, it can go up to $13,000, which is huge. Huge. Um, but at the same time, there's th those trade offs of how do we become smarter shoppers and drive healthcare costs down by not doing redundant treatments, that type of thing, um, and keeping the cost low as possible overall. Uh, one question on uh, Medicare uh, supplemental plans are all Medicare supplemental plans equal? They're not all equal, but they're all identical across all carriers. So um, Medical Mutual's Plan F is ex designed exactly like AARP's United Healthcare's uh, Medicare Supplement Plan. It's the richest one. Plan A is the least rich. There are some things, like we offer silver sneakers with our Medicare Supplement Plans that not all carriers do, but they, it is a very, uh, unlike the Affordable Care Act world, it, they are they are standardized plans and you know what you're gonna get from any carrier and its cost, um, as well as looking at some supplemental benefits. Network's not an issue with that. Any provider that takes Medicare, um, you can go to if you have a Medicare supplement plan and about 96% of all providers, doctors, hospitals, um, accept Medicare. Uh, and I think this uh, may serve as the uh, last question of the night, so feel free to add any final thoughts you might have on this. But the question is about, you know, how can we, you know, uh, improve the cost effectiveness of Medicare, um, you know, other than unilaterally reducing everybody's age to below 65. That sounds kind of drastic. <laughs> it does sound drastic, but, but sort of what, you know, how can that be addressed? It's very, obviously, a lot of costs there in the system. How can um, we begin to, you know, get at those uh, to make it more efficient, I suppose. I think Med Medicare is, you know, starting to do that with the uh, the uh, um, ACOs that they're forming. You know, they're. Uh, I think the uh, impetus behind that is to uh, help drive down, you know, increase value, right? Um, in improve quality and, dr and drive down cost. And um, there have been some success with that. Um, been small numbers, but uh, you know, they're in their. I think it's fourth year now that the ACOs are in, in we're in their, it's kind of the second generation of that. So um, I think that's their uh, their way of trying to see if you know if we can we can put on the healthcare systems, the providers, and the patients, you know, that that value based premise, and then reward for that. Uh, that you know we can see if we can drive down costs, and um, that, that's probably the, uh, the the area I see where that would be helpful. And I also look at a Medicare Advantage plan, for example. Um, it, we get rewarded as carrier um, by certain quality measures. They're called STARS measures that are dictated to us by CMS. Um, and it really is the difference if we deliver 
on the STARS measure versus not, whether you make many money at all on that product to cover your cost or not. And, and so an example of a STARS measure is um, readmissions and driving down readmissions, which helps drive down the cost of Medicare. So we've implemented things like, and I'm sure Sarah would love to hear this, um, a meals plan. So if you've been in the hospital, we'll send meals um, based on what you need for a week because that might be hard for you to feed yourself and when you're just getting out of the hospital and that's had a positive impact on our readmission rate. So I think there's some things like that that We've got the rules and we figure out creative ways to help drive down cost and, and help patients. And I think many people end up incurring the highest amount of medical costs and expenditures in the later years of their life. Um, so are there some decisions that we could be incentivizing people to make in their 30s and 40s that might change what health care costs they actually end up incurring at 70 and 80 and hopefully well into their 90s? Um, I think smoking is a big one. And as we probably start to see some more changes in lifestyle, um, diet and exercise continue to pop up in really everything that I'm reading and seeing from a population health standpoint that those are some very, I wouldn't say easy, but those are personal choices and decisions and changes that we can each make. And I'm guilty of it and of not making some of those choices on a regular basis and was thinking of what am I going to text my husband after we finish here to see if he's either picked up something for dinner or I can pick up. <laughs> um, but at the same time, then I'm going to see if I can get on the treadmill later and increase my steps because I've been at my desk all day. So it's, it's a trade-off. And there's also things that we're really starting to explore as a, a health insurance industry around end of life decisions. And can we have, it can be hard with husband and wife, for example, to sit down and have those tough conversations of, I have a fatal illness, I want to keep trying for my husband. My husband is like, oh my goodness, you know, she's going through all this. And, but it's hard to have those conversations. And so having those kind conversations of, Hey, Heather, is this something you want to continue? Well, no, not really. I'm just you know, doing it for Charlie. And Charlie's going, no, I don't want to see her go through that. And so just helping people think through some of those end-of-life decisions based on their preferences, um, I think, can help bring make, make people have a happier end-of-life as well as help with some of the, the Medicare costs. Well, I want to personally thank all the panelists for uh, donating their, their time and their expertise tonight. Uh, I think it's been a great discussion. I think we've all learned a lot. Uh, so please, a big round of applause.